and uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this presentation is, uh, is, is partly a result of uh, a collaboration which started in Cardiff and Abu Bakr uh, was uh, here as part of his master's uh, work uh, at Jomek uh, School of Journalism. And uh, his work uh, with the mountain communities really inspired me to actually go ahead and try to understand uh, the dynamics which were those which those communities were experiencing. Uh, when I got the impact acceleration fund uh, by the university, uh, it was a very good opportunity uh, and also to take advantage of the lockdowns, COVID lockdowns, which meant that we could actually uh, discuss and collaborate and conduct webinars just like today across uh, the boundaries, uh, which wouldn't have been possible otherwise. So in today's presentation, uh, what we are going to do is to look at the, the this, this crucial social, economic and ecological role of the mountain regions. And in our case, particularly the mountain range, which is collectively termed as Hindu Kush, Karakoram and Himalaya region. Uh, the focus will be on Pakistan, uh, but the overall, the, the whole HKH region in short is often termed as the third pole because of its uh, the, the third largest glacial deposits, freshwater deposit, deposits outside the two polar regions. Uh, we will be discussing how the human settlements and biodiversity and ecosystems uh, are presently at risk from the impending changes, uh, particularly in the climate, but also how uh, other changes are taking place. And then maybe able to discuss some, identify some key challenges and possible ways forward. Uh, moving on, uh, the next slide uh, shows uh, the two the two poles. Uh, Wibukar, could you move on to the next slide? I'm trying it. Uh, it seems that unfortunately. Let me let me try one more time. The technology never fails. Just just one second. Um, So while Avakar is trying to deal with the technology, yes. So uh, when, when we talk about the, the polar regions, uh, we are not talking about uh, in the sense of the magnetic poles, but in terms of the freshwater deposits. So when we look at the South Pole uh, uh, on the left, Antarctica, uh, we can see uh, that uh, the, there are, the red line shows uh, uh, and uh, the white uh, bit shows the current deposits, recent deposits, and red lines shows the historical uh, deposits of, of ice and fresh water. So what's happening in Antarctica, that it is uh, uh, the largest nature reserve in the world, uh, but we already uh, have been coming across various uh, news about the, the cracks appearing and large uh, slices of glaciers being uh, melting or separating uh, from the continent. Uh, there are many uh, scientific stations uh, located there, but uh, the, the, the future of Antarctica appears to be in doubt now, especially uh, with the recent announcement by the Australian government that they were planning to build a huge uh, concrete runway out there. So we are not sure how things are going to shape if uh, any such uh, race starts between the current occupants uh, of the continent. Uh, the, on the right hand side is the North Pole, the Arctic uh, side, uh, which is also showing signs of melting glaciers uh, and melting ice sheets. Uh, and in, uh, as a result, has been, uh, there has been huge contentions, political struggles, economic uh, arguments going on on making use of the Arctic routes as shortest sea routes uh, to reach from point A to point B. So, uh, the, the melting uh, ice in the Arctic is showing huge commercial potential uh, to the nation states. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, we will see that the, the Hindu Kush and Himalaya region, the mountain ranges, um, is widely known as the third pole because of its, uh, its ice fields. They contain the largest reserve of fresh water outside the polar regions. Uh, the region is the source of uh, 10 major river systems. Uh, it provides irrigation, 
uh, it provides power, it provides uh, drinking water, and it actually uh, can actually contributes to the living of uh, almost 2 billion people in Asia, um, almost a quarter of the world's population. Uh, the next uh, slide shows the, the, the current issues, the current problems which this third pole is facing. So on the one hand, uh, it's providing bread and butter to, the, to, to a huge number of people, uh, but with the rising temperatures, uh, there are increasing incidences of melting glaciers, which Abu Bakr will mention later. Uh, there are rock slides uh, which uh, made huge news in India a few months ago. Uh, there are continuous uh, regular landslides incidences and also bluffs, uh, which is a short for the glacial lake outburst flood, a very technical term, which Abu Bakr will explain later. I'm just uh, using it to show my technical expertise. Uh, there are also pollutants, uh, microplastics and aerosols appearing in the atmosphere in this mountain regions. And they are actually affecting the upland ecology. Uh, towns and cities are increasing, they are expanding. Uh, and they, they are also because of their nice nature uh, places. Uh, huge tourism is being uh, attracted there, national, international. Uh, but which it remains largely unregulated, which is another cause of concern. Uh, the cities themselves are expanding. Uh, the towns, the, the, the populations in those areas, they also like to see, uh, like to benefit same facilities that uh, uh, any other city inhabitants will, would like to have. They would like to have some roads, some concrete infrastructures. And this, is also, this also means that uh, local uh, towns, they are losing their original uh, texture, their original ways of living, and they are adopt new ways of living using concretes, especially to build uh, the houses, which are resulting in, in even more uh, problems, which we'll discuss later. Uh, the next slide uh, shows uh, one of the uh, very, very crucial incidences which happened, just to give an example. Uh, the case of uh, Atabad Lake. Uh, it, uh, these are the three comparative images which I have put um, copied from Google Earth Engine, uh, just to give you a time lapse of how this area looked like in 2009. Uh, in 2010, uh, there was uh, a landslide uh, which submerged uh, some villages, uh, submerged the, the highway uh, which connects Pakistan with China uh, and created a new lake uh, which really disrupted the life and resulted in, in the loss of life. Uh, this lake is currently in existence and has actually become a tourist attraction. Uh, so moving on, I would like to hand over uh, to Abu Bakr uh, to uh, give us some reflections from his research experience. Uh, and his analysis. So it's over to you, Abubakar. Let's see if the technology works with you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Abhishek. Uh, unfortunately, though we did try, but uh, it's still, uh, there's still an issue. Okay. Uh, yes, so uh, the research that I conducted at Cardiff University's School of Journalism, Media and Culture was uh, how cl climate change impacting lives and livelihoods in the Hindu Kush Himalaya mountain ranges of Pakistan. The reason I chose this uh, my, as my research was because uh, this area is highly vulnerable to changes in, uh, in climate and uh, is witnessing various extreme weather events. To, be, to begin with, this uh, uh, piece of uh, knowledge product is the most comprehensive uh, uh, research on the situation of glaciers in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, which stretches across eight countries. So if we, if we take a look into this uh, publication, it, it reveals that, you know, if we have, even if we are able to limit uh, global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, this would lead to temperature rise of 2.1 degrees Celsius in the mountains. 
or a two degree Celsius temperature rise would be 2.7 degrees Celsius. A four to five degree Celsius rise in temperature would be five to six uh, degrees Celsius in the mountains. So we have to uh, control uh, emission rise as soon as possible if we want to limit uh, the impacts of climate change on these mountain regions. So the HKS region of Pakistan, it comprises of Khyber Bakhtunkhwa province, uh, uh, parts of Balochistan province, Azad, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, Gilgit Baltistan and uh, uh, federally administrated uh, uh, tribal areas, which is now merged in Khyber Bakhtunkhwa province. The research question that I adopted uh, and focused on were that how is climate change threatening, uh, how is the temperature rise threatening glaciers and putting lives and livelihoods at risk, uh, how is water and food security a threat to Pakistan's sustainable development, and how can how can climate communication play a role to advance climate change adaptation and mitigation, and how are the snow leopards getting impacted from climate change? For the first research question on temperature rise, threatening glaciers, and putting lives in livelihoods at risk, I focused on the Groot Valley in Gilgit Baltistan, which is uh, pretty close to an hour hour distance from Gilgit city. It's one of the oldest areas of Gilgit-Baltistan, and it is most vulnerable to changes in climate, uh, especially with regards to glacial lake outburst floods. So this this, this uh, picture, uh, which you can see, is a Barikan Court village in Bagrot Valley. It it witnessed a historic glow event a hundred years back, and uh, since then the area is is uninhabitable. No one lives over there. What now happens is that, you know, uh, these block events, they were one-off events that used to occur once in a century. They were very rare, but now the uh, the occurrence of glacial lake outburst floods is a regular phenomenon. It takes place every year now. The village is completely deserted. So I interviewed, uh, say, Zahid Hussain Hussain Shah, uh, the project manager of a glacial lake outburst flood risk reduction project that was launched by the United Nations Development uh, Program Pakistan and the Ministry of Climate Change. He confirmed that, you know, the increasing number of GLOF events from Hinarchi Glacier, it has recently forced communi communities from Chera village and Gulchi village to migrate to safer places. So by uh, this also means that climate induced migration is rampant. These communities have to move to, in order to save their lives and uh, they are <clears throat> frequently not compensated by the government. <clears throat> so the Goat Valley is home to Burchi Glacier, Uni and Gutmi Glacier, and all of them are experiencing flooding, flooding. So, you know, this area that you can see in the picture, this is uh, exactly the center where uh, the runoff from all these, you know, three glaciers, it comes over on uh, in this area in summers. And uh, it, there's a very high uh, water level in this area and uh, it's, it's very dangerous uh, what the locals they told that you know you just can't can't even stand on this area where i was able to take picture uh, by the end of the year when i was there in 2019. pakistan is home to 7,000 glaciers and uh, more than 3,000 glacial lakes have formed the formation of glacial lakes is also a natural phenomena but uh, the increase in the formation of glacial lakes and the increase in the uh, occurrence of glacial lake outburst floods, that is a matter of concern. So there were 33 glacial lakes that were crit critically endangered. And the number has increased to uh, 133 now. That This was confirmed by the advisor to the Prime Minister on climate change, Malik Amin Islam Khan. Uh, the increase in number, it, it signals that the mountain ecosystem of a glacier, they are at risk. So what the development practitioners in power corridors think of GLOF events and can it possibly impact uh, the water and food security? So this person, say Meher Ali Shah, the Pakistan Commissioner for Indus Water and Joint Secretary at the Ministry of uh, Water Resources confirmed that it can have a serious impact if they occur on a large scale and that they are, con they are concerned with bigger GLOF events with regards to the safety of their existing hydraulic infrastructures, including Tarbela Dam. So Tarbela Dam, Mangla Dam, these are two big dams which ensure water security, food security for the country. If any of these dams get damaged due to a glass incident, it can uh, seriously impact the, the national growth, the national food security. 
So the new dam that is currently being built is the Amar Bhasha Dam, which takes into account the perspective of glacial lake outburst floods. Uh, so they have predicted that, you know, if any such glob incident occurs, uh, the dam has the provision to break, uh, to bear the weight. And if there is a water spill filled and such incident occurs, then there is ample provision to safely pass it through the spill waves, spill waves. Uh, what he cautioned was that if any hydraulic infrastructure gets damaged due to a glove incident, it becomes a threat to the water and food security of Pakistan. So this acknowledgement at the highest level confirms that the, the region, the country is vulnerable uh, to glacial lake outburst floods. So here you can see a glacial uh, pond that I photographed at Tereshing Glacier in a stored valley. Uh, and uh, over there, I was able to feel the impact and what it actually means in the, the northern region. And uh, that climate change it is bound to affect the poorest of the poor. And what we need to do is to join hands for climate action. Pakistan witnesses the fastest glacier melting rate at 2.3% per annum. So this research was published in two publications. Uh, Dawn and uh, Development Plus Corporation, uh, a German publication. So my second research question, how is water and food insecurity a threat to Pakistan's sustainable development? In this regard, I covered uh, a project by uh, WWF Pakistan with support from UC Mode, where a barren land was uh, you know, um, turned green, as you can see in this picture, and 500 apple plants and vegetables were grown using this hydrogram pump that you can see in this picture. Though hydrogram pump is a 17th century invention, but after some tweaks and given that it was needed in the Gilgit-Baltistan region, this was introduced. And it has helped to revive areas where uh, water couldn't be lifted. So, you know, these technologies could be useful in ensuring water and especially food security. What the, uh, the, the Ministry of Climate Change officials say uh, is that, you know, the monsoon season is shifting towards the north. And towards the north means uh, the north of Khabib Bakhtum Khab province and Gilgit Baltistan region, which means that. If, if these regions are going to witness more rainfall, uh, the areas, the plains of Punjab and Sindh are going to receive less rainfall and that the agriculture in the plains will get impacted. Does this mean that uh, having more rainfall, uh, so we should uh, plant uh, more wheat or rice in the northern areas? Experts say completely no, because what they say is that, you know, the area is already too fragile. And if we are experiencing um, such crops that can be further detrimental that, you know, we should not Punjabize the region. This was uh, said by Ali Dukir Sheikh, uh, the, the member of Pakistan Climate Change Council in, a, in an interview. Another expert, uh, Dr. Pervez Amir, he said that, you know, if we are having more rainfall in the northern areas of Pakistan, Gilgitistan and Chitral of Tungpa, it's an opportunity to, to grow high value crops such as apples and cherries, which can fetch more money rather than growing wheat and rice, which is not uh, bitter. Uh, so this story, this research was published in uh, Reuters. So this is the headline of uh, the story in Reuters. Sorry, the third research question was that how are uh, snow leopards getting impacted by climate change? These two pictures, these are cam camera trap pictures. In the first picture, you will see that there is a common leopard moving in Chitral Gol National Park, which is a habitat of the snow leopard. A common leopard has never been found and experts were baffled to see this. On the right hand side, there's another a common leopard. We don't know which one this is, was it the same one which was found in Chitral Gol National Park? The experts don't know. So the one in Chitral Gol, uh, the one in Pasu, this, the, the one on the right side was found, uh, you know, moving around Pasu Glacier in Pasu, close to Pasu Valley in Gilgit Baltistan. This is very strange as well, because this is also a prime snow leopard habitat. But this is not new. Uh, common leopard presence in snow leopard habitat has also been witnessed in China. So if you take a look at the distribution of the common leopard, it is situated in the, of course, the mountainous region, but not in the higher elevations, whereas the snow leopard is in the higher elevations. 
uh, what experts think is that one of the experts, Ashik Imran Khan, is he's one of the leading wildlife experts in Pakistan who says that, you know, the common leopard will take so quite a lot of time to adjust to the feeding habits of snow leopards because the snow leopard, it, it feeds and predates on larger animals such as ibex and marco, blue sheep, marco polo sheep. Whereas Dr. Ali Nawaz, the director of uh, Snow Leopard Foundation Pakistan, he says that the common leopard is a stronger animal than the snow leopard and it can push the snow leopard into marginalized habitats where there's limited availability of prey. This can impact the breeding capacity and long-term survival of snow leopards. So this, this research was published in the third poll, Climate Change Threatens Pakistan's Elusive Snow Leopard. So uh, the next uh, research question was, how can climate communication play a role to advance climate change adaptation and mitigation? Uh, being science communicators, it is very important for us to think what, uh, how we can better inform our people who are getting impacted from climate change, what we can do. So the BBC's Climate Asia report, it was one of the you know, most pressing reports that ever has been published on Pakistan's uh, and climate change communication perspective that 65% of the people in Pakistan don't even know the meaning of climate change. And most of them considering that climate change is an act of God. So the report told that, you know, the media coverage of uh, the issue of climate change is inadequate and there is a, a, a great potential to enhance media practitioners understanding of these issues. Uh, as part of this research, I conducted a survey with 15 journalists of Gilgit Press Club. Gilgit Press Club is a fairly small press club, which has around 33, 35 members. And I was able to interview almost half of them on various issues pertaining to climate change communication, because they are the ones who are responsible for disseminating information uh, to the outside world on the impacts uh, that are happening in Gilgit What are the reasons for lesser coverage of climate change issues of the Hindu Kashmir region in media. So uh, approximately a quarter thinks it's politics and uh, most of them uh, think that it's the ignorance of environment that uh, media uh, uh, is unable to realize the importance uh, of environment. Is the government of Pakistan taking sufficient measures to train journalists in the HKH region of Pakistan for effective reporting? Almost everyone, 100% said that the government is not taking any measures, sufficient measures to build their capacity, which means there's a huge gap that needs to be bridged. And the, the next question was that is the media in Gilgitistan effectively highlighting climate change in the HKH region through various sources of media? So a quarter said yes, a quarter said no, and a quarter partially agreed with it. So it means that you know there are some gaps that should be bridged. In what ways the media coverage of climate change in the HKH region of Pakistan can be increased? So more than a quarter believe that you know media training is, is essential and that it should be done by the government, by the civil society, by all the stakeholders because media is an important segment, a critical pillar of our society, and they have to be trained for effective climate reporting. And uh, Others believe that public service messages, media training, climate change education in schools, a combination of it can help to uh, <clears throat> increase media coverage of climate change. Uh, on the question on how, on whether climate change stories are difficult to produce for journalists stationed in the HKH region of Pakistan, uh, more than 90% said yes. So this uh, is a point of concern that, you know, they're finding it difficult. So, you know, they don't produce and then they find it difficult to produce, which means that they have serious capacity issues. This needs to be addressed by the media organizations, by the government, by the civil society and all of the stakeholders. And the last question, the most pressing one, that the knowledge on climate change, which is mostly in English, does it make it difficult for the journalists in HK region of Pakistan to understand and produce new stories? So 75% of them said yes. The acknowledgement that the uh, all the research that is being produced in Pakistan and all around the world with regards to climate change in GB, the journalists, they are unable to understand. They are unable to get the real meaning of it. This is uh, quite of a significant failure on part of, uh, of those who are producing knowledge products, but they are not translating in local languages. It is 
or you know it is it may not be even important that you know uh, a, a full research is, is translated into a local language uh, just a summary of four or five pages could be you know translated and shared in local languages with the journalists you know if you really if you really want to have an impact at the ground level so the analysis that we came up with was that you know the impacts of climate change are being felt by people living in the region the area is more vulnerable to natural disasters and the frequency is increasing climate change is impacting the water resources in the form of increased glacial melt changes in monsoon patterns which can compromise food security and eventually uh, threaten pakistan's sustainable development the local media in uh, the region needs capacity building support uh, they need uh, they they want knowledge in the local languages and government support for greater reporting on climate change and more research is also required on local and national media's reporting of climate change in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region perspective so that we can figure out some more problems and figure out come up with solutions on how to how to deal with such problems uh, and with snow leopard getting impacted by climate change the high mountain ecological system is threatened due to climate change impacts snow leopard conservation and climate change adaptation and mitigation needs to go hand in hand so with the intrusion of common leopard in snow leopard's habitat this is confirmed that you know some shift in weather patterns is happening which is forcing the common leopard to shift to move to higher elevations, which it never did previously. Why it is happening? This needs to be investigated more, and research organizations need to come up with it. Now, I would request um, Dr. Abid Mahmood Sahab to uh, to take the lead and share the conclusions of um, you know that we came up with in the last webinar uh, on uh, the climate change impacts in the Hindu Kush region. Over to you, uh, Abid Sam. So, um, based on the, the research findings uh, which Abu Bakr shared, uh, we organized a seminar back in December and we invited some of the people which Abu Bakr had already in interviewed, but we also invited some uh, additional people uh, that included uh, the Vice Chancellor of the Karakoram International University. Uh, which is located right in the middle of these uh, these mountain areas. So they are right at the forefront uh, of their of the research and understanding of the situation. Uh, so it was a, a very useful, very interesting conversation to have uh, with, a, with a group of experts and civil society representatives. And uh, these were the conclusions which they shared, uh, which uh, more or less also reflect what uh, we have just mentioned in terms of uh, the role of experts, the policymakers, the politicians' views, and and uh, the the changes in the biodiversity taking place there. Uh, so the first of all is the the there's the impacts of climate change are increasingly visible on, on glaciers uh, in terms of their melting, but also in terms of food security uh, for human settlements, uh, migration and loss of species in mountain regions. Uh, so it, uh, there is a need for capacity building among local communities to address uh, these challenges uh, and to also adopt uh, with the warming climate. Uh, the, the temperature rise rate is very high in mountain valleys than uh, the plains as it was observed and it was also evident from from in the mountain regions uh, where the communities are already vulnerable to social economic and environmental shocks as we as we have uh, discussed earlier uh, the education and research institutions role uh, has appeared especially those who are closer who are located closer but also those who have expertise uh, about the situation of the mountain communities in these areas uh, it's also uh, very important in terms of directly engaging with the people and places uh, not only to map the geophysical and geopolitical risks but also to carry out disaster forecasting vulnerability assessment uh, and and also uh, communicate with the local communities uh, and as well as promote training and development for better climate action through national regional or international collaboration so in in that sense the education institutions are, are quite privileged uh, the, the role of civil society is also very important and uh, it was also it emerged that uh, many of the cso's they have been playing a, a mediating source between the academia uh, policy and the communities in those mountain areas 
uh, these organizations have typically had very limited resources, but still they, they try to manage uh, through local and international networks. Uh, they are part of many action and awareness raising initiatives. They've also been successfully scaling up uh, many models of development uh, to help prepare mountain, mountain communities for adaptation and mitigation measures. Uh, the, the spread of pandemic has been, has added some more challenges uh, to these uh, CSOs, particularly the local ones, which are already resource starved. Uh, but uh, there are international agencies, uh, WWF and IUCN, they have been very actively collaborating um, with the local communities uh, and a number of stakeholders and actors. Uh, and to they have they were also their representatives were also there in the in, in the discussion and uh, they actually told us about how uh, they were using different ways to tackle the impacts of climate change through a participatory and inclusive approach. Uh, next, there is uh, there are further conclusions uh, in terms of the the role of policymakers. Uh, the next slide uh, shows. Uh, more, some more bullet points. Uh, first of all, is the role of the policymakers, uh, as it appears that the need to be much more aware. Uh, they need to. They should be much more aware of the plight of the people in mountain areas. So instead of looking at uh, the high precipitation as an opportunity, they should also consider the risks these communities are facing, uh, and as well as biodiversity. Uh, the, so the, these communities, they are the ground zero in particularly in this area uh, in, in whenever any environmental challenges or disasters occur. And there are also strong possibilities that uh, the next few decades, the river plains and the deltas would suffer permanent loss of fresh water supplies from the upstream uh, sources in the HKH region. Uh, there are some projections about freshwater flows to be to reduce over time from 60 to 80 percent uh, in according to different forecasting techniques and models. Then the local media has been playing a very important role in highlighting the climate change because people they do <laughs> refer to local uh, local newspapers, local media outlets uh, when trying to verify news or, or they also trust those news. Uh, but still, uh, even those media representatives, they have been facing serious capacity issues, uh, especially in terms of climate change, as Abubar has already mentioned. Uh, there are very limited opportunities which exist uh, for any investigative kind of journalism, uh, more of a research focused journalism, uh, due to the perceived lack of interest, benefits or support of any, any story or any storytelling about climate change. There are also financial constraints, which many of the journalists they are facing. They, they are not supported um, uh, comprehensively by their uh, media organizations. Uh, so they have to uh, improvise and uh, work on their own uh, and improve their own capacity and uh, train themselves. Uh, so there is also a need uh, which was discussed at the webinar in that there should be the schools of journalism should be much more conscious of raising climate change related uh, subjects and awareness in terms of uh, its effective reporting. Uh, and then finally, the, the predicament of uh, these, these remote rural and largely disconnected mountain communities uh, are need to be prioritized in academic uh, research and political and policy discussions. And not only would such efforts go a long way in raising climate change awareness uh, for greater action, but also contribute to the improvement of climate science and well-being of the communities besides saving biodiversity in, the, in these uh, regions. So these were the, the outcomes uh, from the discussions uh, based on this research. Uh, and finally, I would just uh, like to thank uh, Cardiff University and uh, Impact Accelerator account team uh, for providing this opportunity. And also I think uh, the, the institutions uh, like Sustainable Places Research Institute in Cardiff and the, the forthcoming uh, Social Science Research Park, SPARC, as we call it, uh, they are going to offer some uh, huge opportunities as meeting places uh, for interdisciplinary, multi-sectoral, cross-cultural, international dialogue 
uh, in terms of research, policy, practice, action in, in tackling climate emergency in, in this kind of regions, which do not usually attract much attention in many cases. So we will conclude here uh, and uh, we are open to questions or comments if there are any. Thank you very much both. That was really, really interesting. Um, yes, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to um, use the chat function at the bottom of the screen uh, and we can um, we can put those to both Abid and Saeed um, as they come in. We'll give people a, a minute or two to have a think about what they heard and, and formulate some questions. Okay, we've got a couple of questions coming in, so I will, um, I'll get to those in the order that they've come in. So uh, the first question says, the region you're discussing is also an area of heavy land use change, groundwater extraction, and other impacts on the freshwater system that are independent of climate change, but dams, etc. So there's two questions. Firstly, how clear is the science on the specific impacts of climate change relative to land use change in this region? And I'll come to the second one in a minute, if that's okay. I don't know who'd like to... Who'd like to field that question? Yeah, Abbott? so in, in terms of the first question, how clear is the science on the specific impacts of climate change? Uh, as I mentioned, the Karakoram International University, KIU in short, is located there and they have been collaborating with a number of international organizations. Uh, they have been carrying out funded research uh, and uh, a lot of uh, scientific evidence which they discussed and presented and they have produced a number of reports and scientific models uh, which uh, confirm that these uh, communities are at risk and uh, the, the changing in climate is one of the key impact factors uh, for them. Thank you very much, Abid. Um, Saeed, did you want to add anything on that question or are you happy for me to move to the next one? No, that's perfect. We can move to the next one. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so then secondly, it says, how do you discuss this complex relationship between climate and land use change with communities? I would like to uh, respond to that. That's okay, Abhishek. Yeah. Okay, uh, so with, with regards to the relationship between climate change and land use change, so uh, what we are witnessing in uh, northern Pakistan, particularly in one of the, you know in the main centers such as uh, Gilgit and Hamza, is that there is a rapid haphazard conversion of prime uh, you know fertile agricultural land and you know, turning it into hotels and restaurants. So what uh, the experts foresee and, and what they fear is that you know, if this continues, uh, eventually this would impact food security. And what happens is that you know, unplanned development, uh, it can always have repercussions because you know, the infrastructure that is built that is you know, made of concrete and it's not very climate resilient. And especially in an area where temperature goes to minus 10, minus 20, this is one factor. And second is that there are various surging glaciers which threaten uh, infrastructure development projects. For instance, the, uh, the surging of one of the glaciers uh, which threatened uh, one of the bridges uh, on Karakoram Highway uh, near Hunza. That was a matter of grave concern. So if we are building and constructing without proper planning, uh, which means that our vulnerability will further increase. Pakistan is already the eighth most vulnerable country to climate change according to the in the long term index, according to German Watch uh, the latest uh, report. So this needs to be clearly realized. What the government has now done uh, is that in my conversation with the deputy commissioner, you know the uh, the government has appointed. Uh, it, you know, officers in various uh, districts uh, who are in charge of that district. So the deputy commissioner of Bilgit City, he said that, you know, they are now working on land use uh, planning laws and eventually coming up uh, with a set of recommendations after which, you know, no such haphazard planning will take place, which is a good sign that, you know, at least the future planning would be made, made more resilient. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Abit would like to add to it, please. No, it's okay. You have answered the question. Thank you. 
Brilliant, thank you very much. Okay, next question said, is Pakistan's government cooperating with neighboring countries where uh, Hindu Kish Himalaya stretches through? Yeah, the thing, Abu Bakr is the best position because he is a part of this organization, ECMOD, which is at the forefront of bringing together these uh, all the Asian countries uh, on a single platform. Thank you so much, uh, Abu Sad. So <clears throat> the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, you would see it is, you know, has been established after support uh, from the eight uh, HKH member countries <clears throat> and also other co donors. So uh, what happens is that, uh, you know, organizations such as EC Mode, after getting, you know, funding from the government of Pakistan, we produce researches on supposedly, you know, as we talked about glacial lake outburst floods. So uh, the glacial lake outburst floods, uh, they are a serious threat, not just in Pakistan, but all around the world. So EC Mode has produced a couple of researches on glacial lake outburst floods and uh, on how, uh, the water towers of Asia, you know, this DHKH region known as the water tower of Asia, how it is getting impacted. So through knowledge, knowledge exchange, this is being done. And uh, then is to, through uh, technology transfer. For instance, you know, this uh, project that I showed you on food security, the one on hydrogram pump. So you know, EC mode collaborated with WWF Pakistan to uh, initiate this project in Bujal, Hunza, Gilgit, Baltistan. So through knowledge exchange and technology transfer, these kind of uh, innovations are taking place, uh, which is helping to adapt and mitigate climate change. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, so we've got a comment um, next that says, um, I second with panelists that communities here are experiencing the impacts of climate change already. So recently we are waiting for a glacial lake formed at the Chipsa Glacier in Hunza to burst and last year the same lake washed away a portion of the main road which was connecting Pakistan with China. Um, and then we've got another question. So it says to educate the journalists on climate change, what type of training do you think is needed in Pakistan? Uh, Abitza, would you like to address it? No, I think you interviewed those people, so you you are better positioned. Okay, <clears throat> now first I'd like to uh, just say the boss. I think I know say the boss. He's from the IUCN manager CPEC, I believe, a good friend of mine. So with regards to uh, the formation of glacial lake at Sheespur Glacier, I, I talked about that surging glacier and how it damaged parts of uh, the highway. And um, it, you know that 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 route is part of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. So surging glaciers could be uh, detrimental for development, uh, and uh, if that development is not sustainable. So the deal is that you know uh, these surging glaciers they need to be more studied. That you know why uh, is this uh, this surge happening? I also uh, did a story for the news on Sunday sometime back on on this entire phenomena that how this surging glacier uh, of, you know, the, the surging of Shishper Glacier has uh, affected the lives and livelihoods of the communities uh, over there. And uh, also that uh, uh, what, what's needed is uh, that uh, better uh, preparation. And if you want to uh, save lives, which is uh, very important because, you know, if a glacier 15, 20 kilometers long, if it is surging, there is less that we can do immediately to stop it. And the, the best, uh, the, and the first step would be to immediately uh, evacuate the communities who might get affected uh, from such a potential natural disaster, natural disaster. Uh, on the second uh, point, question by Shok, uh, this question by Shokat Ali, to educate the journalists on climate change, what type of training is needed? So it has to be a two-pronged strategy. First would be to tell them about climate change around the world, why emissions are increasing, and why this uh, matters to us, despite our emissions, our, Pakistan's emissions are less than 1%. So the journalists need to be told that, you know, climate change is an issue that affects every person, every living being on earth. And now it's important that you know, instead of blaming someone else, we need to fix uh, our things back home. So with this approach, they have to be scientifically trained. And the second would be that how to report on climate. As I did my research and I figured out that, you know, journalists have some issues understanding 
climate change, reporting climate change, and even comprehending knowledge products that are in the English language. So their capacity needs to be built because you know uh, to understand reports in English, at least the executive summaries, which is very important. I mean that you know some organizations would be able to come up with uh, some knowledge products in Urdu and local languages, but uh, we should not expect everyone uh, to do that, you know, and at times the priorities of some organizations might be different and they don't do it. So the deal is that we have to adopt. We as science communicators, we need to learn. If we are, if we fail to learn, then others would follow suit. There would be other, other uh, journalists or there would be social media influencers who would take the lead. So this is a race against time. So, you know, if a glacier is surging in homes in uh, you know, close to Hunza, it is the responsibility of that journalist to break the news, you know. This is important for his profile. This is important for his region, which is getting more vulnerable. So first, the uh, technical understanding needs to be built. And second, reporting on climate change uh, needs to be enhanced. And for that, uh, you know, uh, uh, environmental experts and journalists, they both need to, you know, uh, like train journalists they need to come and build the capacity of such journalists. And I would also like to add uh, to you, Abu Bakr, that uh, there is, it is also an opportunity for international collaboration. So, for example, the School of Journalism in Cardiff University, they can actually provide tools and techniques uh, based on their own experiences. The experts who are there, they are quite uh, well-known professionals working in Jumek. Uh, so in these kind of direct relationships could also be used to train uh, the journalists on uh, the techniques of reporting uh, such critical issues. Okay, thank you very much both. That's, that's, that's really interesting. So we've got um, two, two further comments. Um, so firstly saying we need to conduct strategic, oh, sorry, my screen is wrong. We need to conduct strategic and strategic environmental and social assessments of the mega infrastructural development initiatives, uh, including those under BRI. I think follows on from Saeed's comment and then um, secondly said it's uh, I think it's a major problem that I think the major problem is that government as well as the international organizations including UNDP are not taking climate change very seriously um, in, Jil in Jiljit um, and yes that that Kakarun International University can take the lead on this so kind of comments on what, what's been said. So I will take this opportunity uh, because our director TC Hales is also here. So I was wondering if, um, while we are uh, answering these comments, uh, Abu Bakr can answer these comments. If uh, TC could also uh, give us some feedback uh, based on his own research on similar occurrences um, in, in China and what are the results? Um, too much focus on the environmental assessments and uh, these focus on building dams. How? how obvious uh, uh, are some, some critical issues which could be uh, uh, overlooked in these cases. So Abu Bakr, you can answer these questions in the meantime. All right. Uh, with regards to Zahid Hussain Sayyid's comments, uh, I interviewed uh, Zahid Hussain uh, in Bagrot Valley with regards to the, the, the glacial lake outburst floods. So uh, what needs to be done is uh, that there could be uh, the progress could be slow uh, at times by organizations, by the government in implementing projects. Uh, what needs to be done is that all resources and all expertise they, that needs to come together to uh, instantly help the communities which are at the forefront of climate change. For instance, if there's a glacial lake out, there's a glacial lake that can burst any time. So instead of organizations or the government coming up with proposals and then getting it approved and uh, then trying to work on it after six months. So we don't know whether when the glacial lake will burst. So the, the deal is to provide instant immediate relief to the local communities who they don't know much. And the best approach would be, the first approach would be to save lives. And that could be done by establishing, uh, installing uh, community-based early warning systems. So EC Mode took a lead on this and we introduced uh, the installation of community-based early warning systems uh, in various parts of uh, Northern Pakistan. And it helped to detect, uh, you know, potential uh, flash floods or glacial lake outburst floods. And it used to immediately inform the local communities. It used to come up with a beeper that, you know, you need to evacuate now. 
that saved lives. And based on, on our work, it was that the GLOF 1 project uh, by the government in, in the GLOF 2 project was, a, was secured. So uh, it's very important that all resources and all organizations need to come up to help uh, build the uh, resilience of the mountain uh, communities to cl climate change. Okay, thank you very much. I think um, TC might be happy to um, to address that question. We'll give him a second to um, to have a think about have a think about that, and then if he wants, we can um, we can bring him in. So uh, I'm just, I mean, there's, there's a lot of issues here, I guess, um, from a physical perspective, but I think the, uh, the challenges of, of particularly these sort of large um, things like glacial outburst floods, these, these climate driven um, events, because they're so rare, even though they're becoming more common and so large, um, mitigation by putting in dams and things like that is probably not the best way to manage it. It's, it's almost certainly what has been going on there, which is uh, through um, moving, moving people and sort of so softer approaches, you know, providing better chances for the flooding to happen, etc. Um, and I think that's a real challenge is that, that you know, building a dam is not going to help you particularly, particularly um, for something like a glacial outburst flood because they're almost impossible to predict in magnitude and frequency so yeah i think i think it's soft, softer solutions here are probably the the way that it's going to going to go the best and also i was wondering tc based on your own uh, research in in china um, so do you think uh, to what extent or what kinds of softer solutions would you recommend in this case uh, I mean, what? So there's a. There, I mean, essentially, you have to build build around the potential, right? So it's it's providing space. So a glacial lake outburst flood is a huge event. So it's it's providing space on floodplains that is has riparian uh, vegetation and and no built built environment. So I think Syed was mentioning. Um, a lot of agricultural land is being built on now. So, for example, it would be land planning and land use change that would, um, you know, would would help to sort of mitigate the potential, basically getting people out of the way of of the really big potential hazards. Great, thanks very much, TC. That's really really useful. Um, I think in terms of timing, we've got. Um, a couple of minutes left so if we have any final questions we can take those now um give people a second or two just to have that opportunity um just to reiterate that we will make the uh, recording available on the sustainable places website um within the next week or so so if um you haven't been able to follow the entire talk or you want to listen again, um, please do um, take a look at the website and feel free to watch again. If you have any further questions for any of our speakers, then uh, please let us know and we can put you in contact. I'm sure they'd be happy to continue those discussions um, separately as well. Um, so I think with that, I don't think we've got any final questions. So it's just to say um, another thank you to, um, to both Abid and Saeed for joining us today and for a really, really interesting presentation. Um, and I think if either of the speakers have got any kind of closing comments or remarks, I'll hand over to you momentarily and then we can... Uh, we can... So I will just quickly mention because there are some colleagues uh, connecting from Gilgit Baltistan from the mountain regions which we were talking about and some people who have been working there. So just to let them know that uh, in, in Cardiff University we have a lot of expertise and experienced people who can actually uh, help support guide do some joint work uh, in any way possible if you need any support or help. Over to you Avuka. 
Uh, thank you so much, Abitab. Uh, it was great to uh, hear your views, Abitab, and uh, to also hear from TC Wales uh, on his perspectives. I believe that uh, you know, but, uh, with uh, the way it seems that you know the way you know glaciers are surging and the there is an increase in the formation of uh, glacial lakes, and which could turn into glacial lake outburst floods. There is there is a need for more resource mobilization not just by the government, government, but also by the donors so that the civil society can on the ground come up with projects. Uh, and at the same time, the local communities who are not informed about it, they need to be told through media. The media needs, uh, and uh, in this regard, the capacity of media needs to be built. And uh, not just by telling them about what climate change is, but also telling them how to report on that issue. I mean, it's, it's going to take a while, but this is the only way forward because uh, the mainstream media is, uh, you know, uh, is still red. And though there's a rise in digital platforms, uh, but they can be also taken on board. So I believe that with greater adaptation and mitigation, better uh, community-based early warning systems and the capacity building of media, uh, the region could be made more resilient to the impacts of climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much both. Um, I will, um, we've got one or two more comments, but I think we're just about out of time there. So what I will do is I will um, send those on to you directly and you can feel free to respond. So thank you once again for joining us today. Um, thank you for a fascinating talk. And um, yeah, we've got um, a full series of webinars uh, for the next uh, few months. So please do take a look and join us for another one if you're interested. Thank you very much both. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.